Living Word Church, welcome back to uh, our kitchen dining room area, and we're in First Peter. We're just wrapping up the epistle, and we're pretty excited about what it had to say on Sunday. But wanted to, as we've been doing, expand on that and give you some more uh, of the Bible to study, reflect uh, upon. So again, our mission is come here, do, come uh, into community, uh, come to Jesus hear his word, and then do what it says. So today's uh, Bible study will be no different. Our, our challenge to ourselves and openness to the Lord will be to come towards him and to hear his word and then become a doer of his word. Uh, you'll notice I'm wearing my uh, track suit, my jogger. Uh, it's really a, a shout out to Matt Woody. He was one of the uh, young men who came through our internship uh, when we worked at One Hope in the missions um, uh, organization that we lived in Florida, and I heard that Matt Woody was having a birthday, and um, made me laugh to think about uh, how many times he made fun of me for wearing these track suits. So, wearing it for you, Matthew. Hoping you're tuning in from uh, Oregon. Thank you for keeping everyone safe out there. And we hope here in Massachusetts you are keeping safe and keeping well. Um, on behalf of our family, we, we uh, uh, can report that so far everyone's in good health. We're trying to find the right rhythm, just like you are, working from home mostly and, and uh, have all the kids trying to do their enrichment learning. Uh, so there's, there's a whole different feel, uh, and we know there's anxiety, uh, certainly concern for every one of our members who's working in the medical field, and we continue to... Uh, mention your name in prayer. We're thinking of you. Thank you for the um, the faithful work you're doing. It's it's critical. And we also thank uh, our, our ministry team. They're just doing a fantastic job helping with all the media and social media. Uh, they're working uh, probably even harder than, than than we normally do because we're having to to find different pieces and and train ourselves and get going. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to to all of them and and um, share how much I appreciate uh, their participation. So now it's time for us to participate. So hopefully you've got your Bible with you. If not, uh, put this on pause, go run and grab a copy of God's Word, or open up your phone, whatever tool you normally use. And we're going to be in First Peter to begin with, chapter um, 5. And there's just a few closing verses, which we mentioned on Sunday. We're really a postscript to this letter. So we'll pick it up in verse uh, verse 10. And after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So that's pretty much the end of the letter. When you hear the word amen, that's uh, coming from the Aramaic uh, word to say, uh, so let it be, let it be so. It's like, yes, everything we just said, let it happen. And uh, there's some wonderful things happening at the very end. That after the churches of um, uh, Peter's audience were to read this and think of their suffering, and we don't know all the ways in which they were suffering. We know they were undergoing some level of persecution for being Christians. Um, and we can draw from that in our own suffering and think through what are the priorities for Christians who are under suffering. And one of the things we, we read from Peter uh, is that we should continue to do good. Um, if we are going to give a reason for our hope that's within us, if we want to give a defense for the gospel at work within us, uh, we should do that, but calmly and reasonably and, and gently. But really, we should be focusing on our good deeds, our good works as a way to kind of tell everyone, hey, look, we're, we're Christians, but we're, we're not weirdos um, in the way you might think. We may be strange, we may be different, um, but we're, we're, we're also interested in the common good, and we're interested in glorifying God in that way. So I'm so thrilled that our team and, and many of you have been recipients um, of our benevolence. Our team has just continued to give, and as long as uh, Provision Ministry, who supplies so much to us, and so do you, by dropping off canned goods and things for our food pantry. As long as we continue to receive, we want to continue to give. So I want to thank you all for uh, for that aspect. Uh, also, our financial giving, realizing that you're 
maybe a business owner and, and your, your business may be even temporarily closed. So we're praying for you. We're thinking of you. We definitely want to see God's provision reach you. Uh, and there's many of us who are still working and uh, you're doing that from your basement or your home office or, or in some way remotely. So we want to thank you for your faithful giving. We know it's even added stress for you as you navigate all the technology and what's required of you. Uh, but this is, a, this is a moment of doing good. And that's one of the things that, that uh, uh, I love about the end of Peter. He kind of says, look, here's the way Jesus is going to now do good back to you. He doesn't exactly use those terms, but he uses even stronger terms. After we've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, that's where I'd say he's talking about God's goodness. There's something very unique about grace. It has to do with everything that's good that comes from God. And he's saying, that God who has all of that goodness at his disposal, look what he's going to do for you. He's going to restore. So if there's things you've lost during this time of suffering, uh, the promise of God is he's going to restore. He's going to confirm. He's going to reestablish with you his word. He's going to confirm that his promises are true. He's going to strengthen you. Boy, do we need that right now. And he's going to establish you. One commentator said it's like he's saying the same things over and over in a way. Um, not necessarily that there's so much distinction between all four of those things. But nonetheless, he's, if he's saying the same thing, he's, he's really repeating it and getting it home. God's with you now through the suffering. And he's going to give back to you and reset things for us. So we hope that encourages you personally, and certainly as you pray for our nation, uh, we hope that we can, as Christians, share that good news with our nation, with the people around us, family, friends, neighbors who may be super anxious. We don't have to live in that anxiety as we've talked about. We can cast our cares onto the Lord himself. We hope that you're doing that and you're experiencing his peace. And that's where this scripture is going to end up. So let's read on. We're in verse 12. This is now the postscript. The word amen was given. This is that little bit that you write at the end of a letter. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, I regard him. I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who's likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. If we just take that postscript and think about it as a whole, we see a pretty clear theme. There's a lot of relationship being represented there. We're hearing about uh, terms that are really endearing to us and our family terms. Brother. He's calling Sylvanus a faithful brother. He's referring to Mark as his son. And he's calling all the believers, all the people he was writing to, to greet one another with a holy kiss. We know in that time, uh, a kiss of greeting wasn't common between non-family members. It was common, though, between those of a household. When you would see someone, you would give them a kiss, usually on their cheek or maybe their hand, their forehead. But that was a very common expression of love and here now, the Bible's reminding us that we are called brothers and sisters. We have one father. We are one family. And what a refreshment. What a reminder. Of course, you're probably being reminded of that now in your own homes. If you have children, it, it, it's certainly family time. Everyone's home. And that may have its own set of stress associated with. But it is a call to us to remind ourselves that we are the church not people who attend, we're not attendees, we're not congregants, we're not adherents. Uh, we would say member is a term used in scripture, but boy, there's a lot of language used a lot more in scripture that refers to us as family, brothers and sisters. So I miss seeing you as I would uh, hope you miss seeing me. I don't get to see my own biological sister very much, hoping and praying that she's well following what's happening with her through text, largely through my mom. Just like you're probably following what's happening in our church, largely through our church communication. So that you would, hopefully, as we read this scripture, be reminded that our relationship together really has value and meaning.
And we're hoping and praying that if you've joined us online over these last several weeks, if you said, you know what, someone shared a link with me and, and I, I tuned in, I grabbed a hold of it and I want, we're so glad you did. And I hope and our, and our deep desire is that you will also gather with us when the coronavirus has fully passed. That you'll gather with us and we can come into that family style relationship with you. We can meet you, we can get to know you, we can connect you with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And of course, if you're not yet in Christ, if you say, well, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian, I'm not yet positive if I really believe or if I even understand what I'm supposed to believe, we're going to be putting some things together to help you and explain more fully in a very foundational way what it looks like to become a believer of Jesus Christ. What I want to ask you to do is Remain open to Jesus. Keep seeking Jesus. You can even begin to pray to him. And if you come to a place of believing that he is who he says he is, the Son of God, that he died, was buried, and rose again to life, if you believe that he is who he says he is, then you can call upon him as your Lord, which means your king, which means to say, I realize he must have all authority. He died for my sins and he rose again to life, victorious over sin, victorious over death. He might be someone I can put my trust in. And that's what it means to be a Christian. You can pray at any moment and ask, Jesus, would you be my Lord? Thank you for saving me from sin. Take my sin. I confess it before you. And I want you to come. I want you to come into my life. And that's what it means to be born again, is to receive the work of Jesus into our life and ask for his spirit to come and to fill us. So we invite you to do that now. You can do that anytime. And his, uh, meaning Jesus, his love for you is wonderful. And he's looking forward to that relationship with you. Secondly, beyond the family relationships that are so pivotal is a sense of strained relationships are in view. By reading a few of the, the names in the context of what's going on, we don't know exactly when this letter was written, but it was most likely written in the first part of A.D. 60s. So A.D. 62, 63, 64, 65, somewhere in there. And right around that same time, the Apostle Paul was also in Rome, where Peter's writing this from. That's his veiled uh, way of saying Rome when he calls it Babylon. So we were, I'm wondering, at least as a reader of the Bible, if Paul had started a lot of the churches that are at the beginning of this letter, uh, Asia and Bithynia and so on, if Paul was the one who helped establish those, why is it now that Peter is writing to these churches? So it's possible that Peter, being an apostle and being a church leader, is simply reaching out in addition to what Paul's been doing. We know Paul had a lot of letter writing going on. We also know Paul used to travel with Silvanus. Remember, that's the long form of the name Silas. Just like we would use a short form Tim and a long form Timothy. So Silas used to be the, tra he was the traveling partner with Paul. You'll see that evidence in various places in the book of Acts. And now Peter's linked up with, Sil with Silvanus or Silas. So maybe the relationship between Paul and Silvanus has changed, or maybe he's saying, hey, Silvanus is great at this. Peter, you got to have him over to your house. Let him write this letter for you. Or maybe Paul's already went home to be with Jesus. Maybe he's died. And maybe Peter's picking up the mantle of letter writing. We're just not sure. But what I can say is that there was some tension between Paul and another person mentioned in the postscript, and that's John Mark. Here, Peter refers to him simply as Mark. And there was a tension because at one point in the history of the, the expansion of the church, Paul had linked up with Barnabas, who had grabbed Mark, and they were traveling on what we would consider the first missionary journey. And uh, after they got through their first leg of the journey, Mark said, you know what, I'm going home. And he dropped out. And we found that uh, 
a little bit later in the book of Acts, around Acts 15, 16, they were getting ready to go back out, and Barnabas is like, hey, let's take Mark with us again. And Paul's like, no way. He's left us before. He'll probably leave us again. And uh, what ended up happening was Barnabas said, well, I really want to travel with Mark. So Barnabas teamed up with John Mark, and they went back to Cyprus, and Paul selected Silas, now referred to as Silvanus. And they went on the journey, actually, to many of the areas that are being referenced here in this letter. So what, what I'm trying to say is now we're at the end of this letter in the postscript, and here's Peter saying, oh yeah, and Mark says hi. Which is kind of cool, because John Mark was the guy who never even made it to these places. And maybe they'd heard of that. Maybe they'd heard he dropped out on that first leg of the race. Now, we don't know. Maybe he was able to go back. Maybe he had personal contact, but maybe they'd only heard of it, that there was this guy, John Mark, who was on the missionary journey, but he never made it. But now, now Peter's saying, yeah, but this guy's with me now, and he's my spiritual son. Wasn't his biological son. He's saying he is really close. He's like family, and he, he sends you greetings. And man, that is so powerful. And I want us to consider, certainly now during the coronavirus moment that we're in, what does it look like for you and for me uh, to think of this time relationally? People have wronged us. People have let us down. People have left us, just like John Mark had left Paul. How long are we going to hold that against someone? Maybe now that we've tasted of and seen the, the kind of uncertainty of life, and we've seen our our, our fragileness of life. We're so vulnerable as people. We can all get sick and die. Maybe because of our understanding now of life and death, maybe we can be more forgiving in this life. Maybe we can approach our relationships with much more grace. We've heard that phrase twice already in this short passage, the God of grace and the gospel of grace. Maybe God's goodness can truly well up in our heart and our spirit. And we can forgive people. We can graciously extend love to them, even if they've wronged us. Maybe we can let it go. Maybe we can forget it. Certainly, forgiveness is part of the gospel. We would invite you to, to consider forgiving anyone now who's wronged you or let you down. No longer hold it against them. Maybe extend a, a, a text in their direction. If you have the courage, give them a call and you don't even have to reference what happened in the past. Just say, I was thinking of you. I wonder how you're doing. And I want to encourage you to consider that. I was on the phone actually just recently today with someone who was explaining to me that very situation in their life. How she had just been encouraged by another person to just let it go. And she was so happy she did because she's walking freely in her own mind, her own words, she said, you know, Pastor, I'm ready to meet Jesus. I got, I'm not holding anything against anybody. And what a free place to be in. So we want to encourage uh, everyone here to, to, to think about these broken relationships. Think about how we can encourage and maybe mend. And I want to uh, actually call us towards that even more acutely. Look at the final phrase of this postscript. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. I mean, isn't that what we ultimately want as humans, to live peaceable lives? That's what we're told to pray. We should pray according to 1 Timothy for our governors and government, kings and those in authority over us. We should pray that we can live quiet and peaceful lives. And this is what we want in our homes, isn't it? This is what we want in our relationships. This is what we want when we go to work. We just want peace. We just want everything to be okay. And this scripture is saying that that peace is being extended to everyone who's in Christ. And I would suppose uh, that many of us have experienced that peace. We love to come closer to Jesus, and that often happens as we start praying and singing and worshiping Him. We start exalting Him, and we start sensing His closeness. And because He is the Prince of Peace, He will start to come, and we'll feel and know, our whole body will sense His closeness and the anxiety and the stress and all that fades away. We feel peace. And then we know the fruit of the Spirit. According to Galatians, one of those is peace. Love, joy, peace. 
patience, kindness, and so on. We know that peace can actually flow through us. We can extend peace. We can live peaceful lives. And that's all because of the work of Jesus Christ. One of the commentators I read on this passage, he wrote this, Peter Davids, referring to those in Peter's audience, he says, their lifestyle, their future hope, and their present peace are all due to their relationship with Christ. What a powerful statement. Our relationship with Christ is really the most pivotal. I mean, if we're seeing anything as a theme in the postscript, it's this is all about relationships. It's about family relationship. It's about strained relationships being mended. And it's about our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about having a full and loving and, and close and intimate relationship with Jesus. Yes, a belief in him, but ultimately then that belief turns into a relationship in which we get to know him and he knows us. I'm so excited that in a few days I'll be joining with five of our members to do a listening prayer retreat. Now with our technology, we're going to do that in our own homes. And once we figure this out a little more, we'll schedule more and invite all of you. To participate. These are the type of environments we want to help equip you in. How do you hear the voice of the Lord? How do you experience his peace? Yes, we've been given his written word, but he also wants to speak by his spirit right to you. And we know when we hear his word, when the sheep hear his voice, as John's gospel says, we feel calm. We feel secure, and we need that right now. So I'm praying for you that your relationship with Jesus Christ would grow during this time, that you would increase perhaps your times of worship and prayer. Perhaps you'd carve out space in your life and prioritize and reprioritize your relationship with Jesus. Let's get it back up to seeking first the kingdom of God. I would also want to leave you with this scripture. We're going to go beyond Peter now to uh, 2 Corinthians in that God wants to entrust to us peacemaking. He wants to entrust to us the word that we'll see in 2 Corinthians is reconciliation. That part of our experience in Christ is that we're reconciled or brought back together with God in a right relationship. We're reconciled to God through Christ. You recall the story of Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, they were in perfect union walking with the Lord in the garden. They were experiencing that peace. Everything that they needed was provided. They only had one provision. Don't eat from a particular tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If they did, they would surely die. Meaning they would fully experience the good, but also fully experience the evil, and that results in death. For the wages of sin is death, says in the book of Romans. So, what they were told was, here's how you can maintain this wonderful, peaceful relationship. And um, it took a little temptation, and then the sin occurred. And that severed the relationship. There was a brokenness. You'll recall the Lord shows up. The scriptures that you read will say the Lord showed up in the cool of the day. The Hebrew language actually says the Lord showed up in the wind, the rushing wind. And I'm not sure exactly the history of why Bible translators have, have opted to call it the cool of the day, but we now um, can say with a, a surety, this is the wind of God. And you'll recall other passages where God shows up with that mighty rushing wind. And our response to that is humans. Like Moses, when God showed up, he was hiding in the cleft of the rock. We know on the day of Pentecost, that rushing wind blew in. We know that it changes us and it alerts us and in this case, when we read Genesis, and I encourage you to reread it, Adam hides. When God shows up in that rushing wind, he hides, and God calls out, where are you? He says, I was hiding. He says, why are you hiding? He says, because I was naked. I don't know if that's really the... He was exposed, that's for sure. His sin was about to be exposed. He knew he was going to be called to account. Much less about his physical nakedness, perhaps or more about his vulnerability. But now through Jesus, we have, yes, that still human sense of being vulnerable, but we also know that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even our sin. We can come to God with our sin through Jesus Christ, and it, it, we don't have to have the same fear 
as Adam and Eve did, because Jesus has paid the penalty for that sin. I know that sounds too good to be true, but that's what the gospel of grace is all about. That he graciously loves us, he's covered our sin, and he wants us to experience personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He desires to blow into our life again, to breathe life into us. When we stay at a distance hiding in the bush, it's not doing us any good. We're inviting you to come, come to Jesus. And I also, for those who embrace the coming to Jesus, want you to know we're invited to help others come to Jesus. We're invited to help the reconciliation happen between all of creation and their creator. So we'll close by reading uh, from 2 Corinthians. I invite you to turn or open up your copy of God's Word with me, and I'll read it out loud, then we'll pray. I invite you to consider these words and how they may impact you. I'll give a little explanation, but really want to leave you with the word that can resonate and rest upon you and instruct you. Would you meditate on it? Would you consider it? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the ministry of reconciliation. Let me start in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we've concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. We were once distant, we were separated, we were hiding, and he's brought us to himself through the work of Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Not only are we reconciled to God, yay, we're Christians, we can celebrate that, but now he's given to us that same service, that same ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Friends, this is a huge moment in human history. We're going to look back on this and we're going to be thinking and reflecting. There are only several moments over the last 100 to 200 years in North America that have come close to this level of attention, this level of concern, this level of concerted effort. And this is a moment in which our friends, our family, our neighbors are needing the message of reconciliation. Part of the reason they're so afraid in, is because they feel how, how fragile their life is. Their money cannot protect them. There's nothing they can do to control this coronavirus. Everything is spiraling out of their control, and they're trusting right now in that they're getting good information. And when they're not getting the information they want, they feel even more angst and fear. When we are in Christ, we've already been given the information. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. We don't have to fear death. He's already died and rose again. We are in a position to share good news with people. If you die from coronavirus or anything else and know Christ, you shall live. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not die, but will live forever. John 3.16 and this is our hope, this is our certainty, this is how we live our lives, and now is the moment to spread that message. And we're inviting you to do that. That's what the scripture is inviting you to. It's not just a pastor saying, would you help us in this? This is our God, and his message has been given to us, and now he's made us messengers. I'll read on. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him who knew no sin. Excuse me. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, chapter 6, verse 1. Working together with him. What? We're working with God? Yes. Then we appeal to you to receive the grace of God. He says it differently. We appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Yes, we've received the grace of God, but it would be vanity. It would be all for selfishness if we just keep the good news for ourselves and never give it away. Just as we're receiving benevolence and giving it out, we receive the good news of Jesus Christ and we're designed, we're built by God, we're called by God to give it out. I'm inviting you to do that. Encourage people, find Facebook friends, share the services, everything we're providing, get it out. Use your own, what, what the Lord provides for you and share it. The hope and the scripture that he's given to you that you're holding on to, please proclaim it to someone. Please be courageous to even invite people. Would you want to receive Jesus Christ? Otherwise, we're going to be in a situation where we've received all of this wonderful good news of Jesus. And then at the end of all time, when we stand before the Lord, maybe be found saying, why, why were you so self-absorbed? Why did you hold it? What were you afraid of? Certainly, now's not the time to be afraid of rejection. People are clamoring and they are in need of hope. And I'm asking you, join with me. As the scriptures say here, let's join with him. We appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Let's work together and spread the grace of Jesus Christ. This is the way Peter closed. Peace be to all of you who are in Christ. And we thank him that he's given us that peace. Now let's share it with others. We pray that you'll do that. Let's pray it now. Father, thank you for the grace. Thank you for showing us in Christ all of your love. Thank you for demonstrating that love by dying on a cross. Jesus, we thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. Because you did what you did, we can know God again. And we thank you that we have no fear. Your perfect love casts out all fear. But yet we know there are many who are so afraid right now. May we receive your grace and fear not. May we move forward and help people reconcile with you because that was your heart to reconcile the world to yourself. Now help us do our part to share this good news, to share likes with people on social media, to put forward, Lord, the good news, to send emails and phone calls and every form of communication that we can do from any distance. Give us the courage and strength to do it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.